Hello there, my friends. Welcome to Take Me to Eternity. Leah Fiore Tracy here again. I am the host of this podcast, if you do not already know. I've wanted to do this podcast for a while now, and my choosing of topics is actually pretty organic. I write what I feel like my next podcast should be on, and not necessarily always the one that I initially wanted to. In fact, it changes. I've been digging into the conscience. That was my last podcast, and really saw the connection between the conscience and discernment. I've wanting to I've been wanting to do a podcast on discernment for quite a while now. So I think that that's what our podcast is going to be on today. Because believe it or not, I really think it goes hand in hand. So buckle up because here we go. Discernment is the act of discerning, also the power or faculty of the mind by which it distinguishes one thing from another as truth from falsehood, virtue from vice, acuteness of judgment, power of perceiving differences of things or ideas, and their relations and tendencies. The error of youth often proceed, proceeded from the want of discernment. The conscience is um, an internal or self-knowledge or judgment of right and wrong or the faculty, power, or principle within us which decides on the lawfulness or unlawfulness of our own actions and affections and instantly approves or condemns them. Conscience is called by some writers the moral sense and considered as an original faculty of our nature. Others question the propriety of Considering conscience as a distinct fact, faculty or principle, they consider it rather as the general principle of moral approbation or disapprobation applied to one's own conduct and affections, alleging that our notions of right and wrong are not to be deduced from a single principle or faculty, but from various powers of the understanding and will. If you have not listened to my conscience podcast, I would go back and listen to that one because this one kind of goes after it. Um, You'll see the connection if you watch that other one um, beforehand. When it comes to both discernment and our conscience, we need to know that knowing the truth and holding it up as truth helps us to discern what is right and wrong. Though it can be calibrated wrongly if we have wrong information, therefore we need to train our discernment and practice it or it will be too it will be too sensitive or not sensitive enough. Our discernment is hugely affected by this. God gave us the ability to judge right and wrong apart from any other person or guide when he created us. We can be guided to discern right from wrong or the rightness or wrongness of something. And like our conscience, sometimes our calibration's off because we're humans and we're, you know, not fa- not infallible. It's a huge reason we should be in our Bibles, searching and seeking him and his will in everything. He is our recalibration. Why would God be the only one to say what a judgment should be? Psalms 24, 1 and 2 says, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. That's why. That's that's the reason. He's the creator of everything. He gets to dictate what is okay and what isn't because he knows how it, it works. He understands the world, the molecules, the cells, the genes, that he, he understands feelings and all of, he, he understands all of it better than anyone else could ever understand it because he created it. There is only a certain degree of accuracy in and of ourselves because we can shut off our warning system and being human, we're not perfect. And in fact, we are hugely flawed. I heard an analogy from John MacArthur that I'm sure some people won't like, but I I really think it makes sense and that's why I'm using it. 
There was a plane crash where a Spanish plane flew into a mountain killing everybody on board. The black box recording showed that one of the last things that happened before the fatal impact was that a shrill computer animated voice from the plane's automatic warning system came on and told the crew in English, pull up, pull up, pull up, followed by the response from the pilot, shut up gringo, as he turned off the system. In a matter of minutes, the plane smashed into the mountain, killing everybody on board. And I know that's a hard uh, analogy, but I think it's very uh, telling. Unfortunately, so often we shut off our warning system. We tell it to shut up and we turn it off and we ignore it. When we do that, we're disarming the very thing God gave us to help protect us and others. It's like having our check engine light on for a long time. We can ignore it and act as though everything's just fine. Eventually, we don't even notice it when it comes on. Or when our conscience tells us something is wrong, we can say, shut up, gringo, and keep on going with what we're doing. When we were unbelievers, we had some degree of knowledge and understanding of ethical truths, the oughts and the ought nots, we have some degree of accountability in our conscience, which the Bible says accuses or excuses us. We are called every single one of us to discern between things. Yes, that's right. We're supposed to judge. We're told to. Every discernment is a judgment as to if it's right or if it's wrong, if it's good or if it's bad, if it's good, if it's pure, if it's not. What is acceptable and unacceptable? Psalms 2.10 says, now, therefore, O kings, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth. We're supposed to be just in our judgments and discern what would be good and acceptable. But how can we know for sure what's good and right? Well, as believers, we know by the word of God. You know, that's our, that's our guidebook. <laughs> that's what we go through. And reading it one time is not going to do everything it needs to do. It's living and active. You need to be in the word constantly. Um, it, it, you will be growing as a believer if you're in the word. If you're not in the word, you know, you might stay a little stagnant. God gave us the Bible so that we can study and learn from it and know him and his will. It says in 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 17, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All of them. If you intend to live godly in Christ Jesus. Sorry, I had to point that out. But evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped, uh, adequate, equipped for every good work. The Bible is good for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so we may be equipped. If you want to be equipped, you know where to look. You know, if you're going to learn how to be an, a, an electrician, you're going to, you know, read books on elect, being an electrician, right? If we want to live godly lives, we need to be looking to the Bible to tell us how. To have proper discernment, we need to be looking to discern, and we need to be looking at the place that will probably t properly tell us how to do that. The only one who has the right to tell absolute right and wrong is God, not us, not the world around us. We can't rely on ourselves to always know without proper instruction. We have a conscience to help guide us, but even then, we need to look to the word to be calibrated properly and you know, sometimes we need recalibrating often. So we look at our instruction book, a book that has instructions from God himself. 
We pray and are taught how to discern by God Almighty. When you are reading the word of God, you are reading the words of God. Psalms 119.66 says, Teach me good discernment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Discernment is a gift from God, but it's also something he teaches us and that we need to practice. Like all of our gifts, we can use them selfishly and inaccurately. We cannot practice them and in that case mishandle them. We can't be automatically good at something. We need to practice to grow in our discernment and eventually it gets easier to us. God can give us that gift, but we have to use it. You know, it's it's not something that we can just sit on and um, expect to get, have it be good and well, working well, you know. Hebrews 5.14 says, But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. We can't expect our discernment to be automatically calibrated for us upon salvation. It's part of the process that happens as we are made holy or sanctified. That happens with the help of the Holy Spirit and the washing of the word. As we read God's word and ponder it, as we hold up everything next to his word to see if it holds up and is true, we are training both our conscience and our discernment. The more we look at things and filter it through God's word, the more reliable our discernment and our conscience is. We are weeding out the worldly ideas and replacing them with God's truth, which is the absolute truth. Proverbs 2, 2-6 through 6 says, Make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, come knowledge and understanding. We need to work for it, you know, we need to search for it. We need to um, seek it. We need to want to understand and put the effort in. Uh, if we don't, then, you know, we're not going to get much discernment out of not trying to discern anything. It's not just about wanting to know things. It's about understanding the why part. God says, don't do A, B, and C, but why does he say it? We know that there's heresy out there, but what makes it heretical? When we seek to understand and put into play, it goes from a head knowledge to a heart knowledge, or at least to something understood and not just repeatable. We aren't going to know all the things, but there's a ton that we can know. We should be actively looking to be able to put God's truth into action. It isn't just knowing things for the sake of knowing them. It's knowing them because you want to understand them to use them and be changed by them. I can know all the things in the Bible and still not be saved. It isn't until there's a change of heart that anything's different. There are plenty of people who know what the Bible says, but have never sought to understand it or be changed by it. And they have no heart change and they're not, I mean, you know, I can know a lot of things and it not change me. Philippians 1, 9 through 11 says, And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Christ Jesus, through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. I know people who think because they have been a Christian for decades, they should have all the discernment, but these same, same people aren't willing to actually practice it or exercise it. Like our conscience, we can warp our discernment. When our conscience tells us we are doing something wrong and we ignore it and do it anyway, the more we do that, the less we feel the wrong. And like driving around with your check engine light on, all the time, eventually you just stop noticing it. You just stop noticing that it's even on. Your warning system um, means nothing anymore. You're warping it. You can't tell the difference between what's right and wrong in a lot of instances. 
I think some things we will uh, be hyper focused on, or we'll, it'll we'll feel it, and other things we won't because we have desensitized it. Just like that, when we excuse something untruthful and just take the part that is truth, we're telling our discernment not to worry about discerning. When we listen to someone and they say things that we have to twist to make it fit into the Bible, there's a problem, and we're disarming our discernment. When they speak of the Bible in a way that you wouldn't get from reading the text, you're training your discernment to not be concerned with what was meant when it was written and fit it into wherever you want it. You're essentially desensitizing your discernment in your conscience, and that's super dangerous. You know, don't take half of a verse and make it a doctrine out of it. The Bible means what it says, and we can't change it and have it say something different. There are times that it speaks to us and times that it's speaking of us, but we can't mix the two. You know, though, though there are wonderful biblical truths, even when the Bible isn't directly talking about us, we need to take it as it's meant to be taken and not fit it into the places we want it. We're, we are to bend to the word and the word isn't to bend to us. I understand that we aren't going to agree with everybody on every topic. It's not a problem. The problem lies when they mishandle the word and ma change it into something that it isn't. When we're training our discernment, we can't accept falsehood, or in most cases, almost rights, as truth. Satan knows scripture and quotes it, but he twists it in the process. That is what, what so many people do, and a lot of times it's hard to spot the problem, because it's, it's a, a, a simple veering a little bit to the right or to the left, and um, they do it very subtly. They're cunning, you know? The more we hold what they say up to the scripture, though, the more that we practice our discernment, the more we can see the folly, or we can see if they're good or bad, right? We also need to stop putting our definitions in other people's mouths. When they say that they're, when, when what they say is completely different than what we think it is, we just need to take it at, at that. To say Jesus, you have to ask, is it what the Bible says about him? To say God, you have to ask, who do you say God is? This goes with things like salvation, the gospel, and atonement. We can't expect everyone else to mean what we do when they talk. And we need to be aware when they're not saying the same thing. There's a lot of views out there that sound close to right, but still close to right's wrong, you know? If it's almost true, it's not true. You know, true is true. Does that make it so you have to work in order to listen to people? You bet your butt it does. You can't just sit and take somebody else's opinion and run with it. And you shouldn't think that you shouldn't have to put work into. You have no problem spending your time looking into that thing you wanted to know more about. Learning about the thing that interests you. You should care the most about your spiritual food. Where is it coming from? Was it grass fed or is it from a mill? Are there pesticides on it or is it clean and pure? That's something that's far more important than say the food you put into your mouth. It's the food that you're feeding your soul with. This affects everything. 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8 says, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old men, uh, old women. On the other hand, dis discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of a little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. If we warp God, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, it makes me wonder if you revere him. How highly can you look at God? How much fear can you have for him if you change who he has shown himself as and make him different? Things like the shack shows God as a woman. God presented himself as a man. I know God is spirit, 
But who am I to warp the view of him like that? Who is anybody to take him as he presented himself and change it into something else? There are a host of different teachings on a god, different gods, and when they're different, they aren't the same one. We have to use our discernment and say, that isn't what the Bible says, so I'm going to reject it because we are to fear God and we are to treasure what he says and who he is and um, it's it matters. I see some pesticides on that view of God and I'd rather not eat it is what we need to say. You know, there's a little poison on that. I don't really want to put it in my mouth or in my soul, my heart, my mind. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When we fear him, we want to be intentional with what he says. We want to handle his word as a treasure, not to be marred or damaged. If we want to show others God, we must do so with the utmost respect for him. We have to exercise our discernment so that it can be strong and healthy, able to help us navigate through this toxic world. That's, I mean, you know, he gave us this stuff for a reason. If the question is, if you'll offend somebody by speaking discernment, by judging right from wrong, I have to say, who are you trying to please? Would you rather offend an unbeliever or God? I mean, I'd rather not offend God. I hear all the time that in order to spot a fake, you just have to know the truth, and that is certainly true. But most people know the truth, but are unwilling to even accept that someone could be speaking falsely. They just take the, the bill without ever looking at it, because they think they would have to put too much effort in. Or they may see something they don't like. What's worse is when they see it, but they refuse to say anything or even stop listening to him because the person might get upset, or they say things sometimes that they like. So many times we substitute our own definitions for words and excuse what they say because we think we know what they mean, even when they make it clear that the definition's different. It's the same reason that so many Christians say that Mormons are Christians. They aren't willing to call out the differences for what they are or take at face value the word without inquiring on its definition. We have to look before we are going to see the problem and when we see it, we can't brush it under the mat or ignore it. We can't listen to people because we simply like what they have to say. If they're not handling the word properly, then we shouldn't be listening to them. That goes hand in hand with my conscience. My conscience won't allow me to seek understanding from someone I know is a liar. When someone lies, their credibility is lost to me. When someone lies about the word of God, I have no problem tossing out all that they say on the Lord because... Otherwise, I have to spend my eternity on earth, you know, all of my life that I'm listening to them anyways, trying to pick apart everything they say anytime I listen to them. I'm not so smart as to think I can't be deceived or so arrogant to think I will always know the difference. I'm not always going to like what people have to say. And sometimes I like the people that I don't always like what they have to say because they're saying the hard truths and... Um, you know, they're willing to say the things that uh, aren't comfortable because that's what God says. I'm talking about people obviously mishandling the word. So many times people can speak of biblical truths, but what they use isn't even like what they say it is. You know, what they, the, the verse that they use doesn't mean what they say it means. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may approve what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We are to not be formed by the world, but by the word. We are to be transformed by the Holy Spirit and by our guidebook that God himself gave us. That's how we can have good discernment. So many times people want us to turn off our discernment because they like what somebody has to say, but we need to hone it. 
It's loving to discern and warn your brothers and sisters of the block in the road. Please, if there's a block in the road, if I'm talking about some pastor and there's a problem with them, let me know because I these are things that I want to know. I may not always agree, but I will look into it. I mean, <laughs> that that's definitely something I'm going to look into. It's extremely unloving to not warn people and watch them stumble and fall. When they don't see the potholes, walk with them and help them through it. You know, I have people asking me, um, do you know about this pastor, that pastor, this teacher, that teacher? And I will look into them and tell you what I think. You know, I will genuinely spend time listening and trying to understand what they're saying. And then I will give you my best um, idea of what I feel about that person is right or wrong. If, if they're not speaking rightly about the word, I will tell you, this is why this is what the Bible says. Because it's not about opinion, it's about how are they handling the word, right? I know that there are people that can find Satan under every rock. That they are looking because they want to find something wrong. That's not me. I, I, I would love for there to be a plethora of wonderful teachers that, you know, have no issues or, um, you know, music that we can just listen to any of the music that calls itself Christian music because it's all solid. That would be great, but that's not reality. The Bible even says it's not reality, you know. It's the wrong way to look at discernment. The point is to see truth and error and not go to the left or to the right. You shouldn't want people to be speaking wrongly. You shouldn't be happy if they are. We need to pray for those people to come to repentance and a true understanding of the, of the word and to fear the Lord. You know, a lot of them, it's obvious they don't have a fear of the Lord because of how badly they twist scripture. We need to pray for those people. We don't gloat in their folly. Every one of the people that I call out, I pray for. And I pray earnestly. It's a serious matter and it should be taken seriously. These, um, you know, they can lead people astray. And just because you don't think that it's a serious thing, um, this little diversion here and this little diversion there, any diversion from what the Bible says is serious. I think something that everyone should do is figure out biblically what point you flag someone as a false teacher or prophet. At what point do you not only stop listening to them, but also stop promoting them to others? What is acceptable and at what point is it no longer acceptable? I'm not saying condemn them, it's not our job, or even say that they're not a Christian, but how far is too far? You know, we need to think about these things. Too many people draw the line at the edge of the cliff and they aren't willing to even hint that there could be a problem until it's too late. If you are a mature believer and can see the mine, isn't it your job to warn the little baby toddling behind you or the person distracted and not seeing the, the cliff that's in front of them, the hole in the road that they could fall into? We need to really think about these things and take our feelings of the person exp and our experience off of it. it. We need to base it strictly off the word of God. We need to pray about it. We need to lament over it. You know, it's serious. This is something that is serious. This is your spiritual health that we're talking about. As well, excuse me, it's serious for you and your spiritual health, as well as every person who hears you talk about that teacher or preacher or the practice that you're doing. Um, every time we promote someone who speaks almost truths, we could be stumbling somebody or people who aren't believers yet, you know, it could be brothers and sisters or it could just be non-unbelievers. How are we to be witnesses for Christ and yet promote lies and not care or not take the time to find out if it's true or not, you know, if it's good or not, if it's trustworthy. You don't just look at, um, you don't take a Bible in different interpretations of it, different versions, 
open it up, read one verse from each one and say, yep, it's close enough, that's good. That's not how it works. You have to line it up, right? Put effort in, search, seek, find. Um, Jesus is truth. His reflection should show that. We ought not promote people who don't honor God's word. Discernment of what is good and right and true is super important. Part of it is discerning the spirit of the person who is speaking, which is really hard. To discern between spirits is to, to discern between the facade and the fruit. Fruit can be shiny on the outside and rotten inside. It isn't about the look because the Pharisees, they came and they were whitewashed tombs, right? They looked pretty on the outside. They did all the things. Though that's, that is something that we should look at, you know. We do need to look at, are they living godly lives? That's absolutely. Uh, but that's not our only concern. It's how do they manage the word of God? How do they handle it? Um, who do they say God is? Who do they say Jesus is? I mean, there's a lot of things that we need to really care about. Uh, how do they treat people around them? It's another good one. The devil and his minions come, can come as angels of light. They can look like saints, but they will tell almost truth and not actual truth. They will corrupt what God says, and though they may look beautiful on the outside and almost truthful, or they say good things, um, inside they'll be corrupt, you know? Psalms 19, 9 through 14 says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter as than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping it, them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgressions. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The fear of the Lord helps cleanse us because we value him and his judgment over anything. He has given us a way to know what's acceptable to him, but we must study it and also hold the world up next to it to see what looks like the truth and what doesn't. Out of all the New Testament books, there's only one that doesn't explicitly talk about false teachers and false prophets and warn us of them. If the disciples took discernment so seriously, why don't we? Why is it so hard for people to look and say, that's not right, I need to not listen to that person anymore, you know? This verse doesn't say, let me look pristine and flawless. It says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. It's the underneath part that matters. Our words matter. What we say about God matters. Proverbs 16.3 says, commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. When we commit our works to the Lord, he establishes our plans. He makes our way and keeps us, but we need to commit our works to him. We, when people don't commit their works to him, but instead walk in their own ways, they tend to warp and twist what God says because they aren't walking in the manner he wants for them. The world does it every day. You know, everyone does what's good in their own eyes, and that's not what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. They say things like, cleanliness is next to godliness. God helps those who help themselves. God won't give you more than you can handle. I really think that that's when the Bible, I think, mm -hmm, words, I really think that when the Bible says not many should be teachers, that's for a good reason. Maybe because they have a hard time speaking, right? Some aren't qualified to teach. When we speak about God's word, we need to do so with fear and trembling. We need to value God's word above all else. If we don't know, we shouldn't speak on it. And, you know, 
so often we think we know and we speak on things and then we go back and um, we learn better and that's when we need to say I didn't know and um, <laughs> then change the way that we're talking about things right I know the the God won't give you more than you can handle is a huge thing but that's kind of like the point right God gave us more than we can handle and he handles it for us you know we we take his yoke on us you know he takes a lot of our burden when we're walking with him it's not really us so he always gives us more than we can handle it's kind of the point um, when we use our discernment the point isn't just to critique everyone I know a lot of people think that's what I do but the point is to understand truth and fiction to to discern between right and wrong and um, try to help other people not stumble down the wrong road if they can if you can say hey that's the wrong road you know to say I don't like that I don't like what they um, say so I'm gonna tear them down that's a problem the point is to weigh what they're saying and know if it's right or wrong is this person trustworthy to listen to or not is this thing I want to do right or wrong? We're called to hold on to what is good and throw out the rest. And um, I take it serious because I love people. I really genuinely love people. And if I see a house on fire, I'm not going to be like, hey, go check out that house. Go get in there. Yeah, walk right in, you know. I mean, if there's a cliff, and I know it's there and you don't, I'd like to be able to say anything. If if I am walking towards a cliff and you see it and I don't, please tell me because it's important. Jude 1, 3, and 4 says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the, ne the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this con condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. We are told to contend earnestly for the faith, Earnestly means with fixed attention, zealously, with earnestness. We're to stand up for and defend the word of God zealously. There are ungodly people speaking wrongly of the Lord and his word. It says they turn the grace of our God into licentiousness, which means ex excessive indulgence of liberty. That kind of speaks volumes, doesn't it? To, to take that word and, um, and define it, that is wrong and it shouldn't go unnoticed or unchecked. You know, we have liberty, but what are we going to use in our liberty? We shouldn't use it as a, a way to sin, you know, just because we are free from a lot of things. We're not free to sin. That's not the point. Jude uh, 16, uh, excuse me, Jude 1 16 through 23 says there are grumblers finding fault following after their own lusts they speak arrogantly flattering people for the sake of gaining gaining an advantage but you beloved ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our lord jesus christ that they were saying to you in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts there are, these are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life, and have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. They're telling us a little bit about what we're supposed to be doing, right? The people that are going to be and um, how we are supposed to combat that. You know, if 
if there's a war going on for the souls of every person in the world, why would we not contend for the faith um, stronger, harder, more, you know, talk to people? These people follow after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. Man, isn't that the world that we live in right now? It breaks my heart to watch so many of these so-called teachers out there t talking about themselves in a way that makes them look like glow-in-the-dark Christians. More concerning with talking about their own life experiences than what the Bible says. You know, they're, they're more concerned with talking about themselves than actually talking about scripture. They'll use a verse and uh, blow it out of context, or a half a verse, you know. Why use the whole thing if it says something you don't want it to say? It says, In the last time there will be mockers following after their own lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions. We know from 1 Timothy 6.3 that the one who advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of the Bible is the one who causes division. So it's not the person who's calling out things that are wrong. It's the person who's speaking wrongly that's causing the division. These people give you worldly-minded teaching. They speak of man more than God or twist everything into a man-centered teaching when in fact it should all point to Jesus. The whole Bible should point to Jesus. All of it. It's important to understand this and also that we are to have mercy on some who are doubt doubting. I think doubt is more common than anyone would care to admit especially in the beginning years of of learning about our faith and you know it's it's way more common than what people would want to admit to we are to save others snatching them out of the fire how do we do that if we aren't earnestly contending for the faith for the faith for truth when we bend the truth and allow for error how do we snatch people from the fire if we aren't willing to talk about the hard parts, the part that might upset them? It says, and some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. We're supposed to hate sin, hate evil, hate lies, hate almost truths, right? Because that's a lie. Hate things that are polluted by them, tainted. You know, things that are tainted by sin, we are supposed to hate. Things that have the stench on them or pick up some of the filth, we're supposed to hate those things. I'm not talking about sinners, unbelievers. They're not Christians. We can't hold them to the same standards. Um, I'm talking about nasty things, you know. We, we're not supposed to do worldly things that have sin attached to them or grossed out, you know, movies and TV and music that's tainted with sin. We are to stand up for and fight for and treasure truth. God's, God's truth. God's opinion matters more than our own opinion. It needs, people need to remember that, you know, it needs to matter more, more than anybody else's. Discernment is not only necessary, but vital. Our spiritual health depends on it, and as well as the spiritual health of those that we're trying to help. Um, our children, the friends who look up to us and seek guidance from us, the unbelievers that see us and watch us waffle and get blown around because our foundation isn't firm in the Lord. We need to, um, we need to care more, I really think. We need to discern between wolves and sheep so that we can properly know good from bad, right from wrong. We are called to look out for the ones among us speaking lies and causing others to stumble or doubt or act wrongly. We aren't going to agree with every person on everything and that's perfectly fine. It doesn't mean if they teach differently than what we think on certain things, they're a false teacher. It means they have come to a different conclusion in some areas. But the way that they value scripture matters. What they say about it, what they say about Jesus matters. If it's a salvation issue, it absolutely matters. If they change the gospel, 
or won't share the gospel, that matters. Those who won't talk about sin, they're changing the gospel. They're nullifying what Christ did on the cross. Until we know that we're sinners deserving hell and that God came and lived a life on earth, that he died to pay for our sins, we can't be saved. I mean, what are you going to get saved from at that point? You're negating what Christ did, you know? It's something we should never tire of hearing. I, I am not tired of hearing the gospel. I love the gospel. It's so beautiful. That is the good news. <laughs> like, that's the good news, you know? If people won't teach it or you rarely ever hear it from them, there could be a problem with them spiritually, you know? There is definitely a problem with their teaching if they're not teaching the gospel. If, if you don't hear it from them, um, I would use a lot of caution. To say someone is a false teacher simply is saying that they are teaching falsely. I'm not trying to say I know a man's heart and if he is saved or not. I'm just saying that sometimes people shouldn't be teaching because they are speaking wrongly of the Lord. I have friends and listen to teachers that are Calvinists and Baptists, Charismatic, Lutherans, people of all denominations. I mean, the, the division lies when the gospel gets changed, when, when God gets changed, um, when scripture is not valued or it's ignored. Um, if they take a scripture and they do acrobats with it, that's an issue. When it becomes man-centered and not Christ-centered. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 5 says, Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying, Peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman and with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. If you are all sons of light and sons of day, we are not night nor of darkness. Why would we not need anything to be written to us? What's the difference between what we know and what those in the darkness know? We have God's word and that helps us to discern the things to come, to understand the things that are and the things that have been, to know good from bad and right from wrong without the tinge of decay. We have the Bible and it's a guide to goodness and truth. Where our conscience falters, we know the Bible speaks the words of God. You know, when people are saying peace and safety, and that's not what's going on. There's a problem. You know, they're not speaking of the Lord. Later on in verses 12 through 22, it says, But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone, see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for that is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every evil. We are to highly value, to appreciate, to hold in high esteem the ones who are teachers. They are working hard for us and have terribly hard jobs, huge burdens. We ought to be praying for them probably more than we already do. We are to instruct or direct the people who disregard God's truth. Let them know the folly. This is all done with the guidance of the Holy Spirit and discernment and love, of course. How do you know how to treat one if I don't properly judge the situation? If I don't practice discernment, how do I know what I ought to do in that position, right? 
It says we need to always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. We need to accurately judge the situation and do what is best for everyone involved. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks for that is God's will for us. If you want to know God's will, the Bible tells us. We don't need visions. We don't need new revelations. We just need to study his word diligently. I mean, it is the the prophecies are all in the Bible, you know? We we have the prophetic spoken. <laughs> God's word right there. You want to hear God's voice? Read your Bible. You want to hear it out loud? Read it out loud. I don't remember who says that, but I love that. Um, do not extinguish or repress the spirit. Don't despise prophetic utterances. Prophetic simply means messages from God. Don't despise, God, despise God's word. Don't despise those who speak God's word or what is spoken, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good and abstain from every form of evil. Those are almost truths too. You know, don't, don't tell lies. Don't take in lies. Don't accept them. In order to do that, we need to pay attention. Weigh the words we hear. Hold it up to scripture. Do we have any kind of example of it in scripture? Are they speaking rightly about what scripture says? Are they even talking about scripture or is it all about them? Or is it all about experience? Is it all about you? <laughs> that can be an issue too. We can't study scripture selfishly. We can't do it from a narcissistic perspective. That isn't how it was written. Are there parts talking about you? Absolutely. Are there truths you can learn from the rest? Absolutely. I mean, that's what it's there for. But it doesn't have to all be about you directly to be profitable. I'm not David, but there are wonderful things I can apply to my life from hearing about him and the way that God is with him. And um, you hear, you know, you get to learn God's character from the way that he treats people in the Bible. It's, it's their testimony, not yours, right? That's how we see the character of God. And so often we make ourselves out to be the thief on the cross who believed. But in fact, we would have been one of the soldiers putting him on the cross. I, I think that's totally true, you know. I'm not sure why we know that the road of salvation is narrow and not many will find it, but then we think that all the people who call themselves Christian are and should be safe to listen to. We hear someone say, God, and are like, sweet, they're believers, when in fact, really, they could be actually talking about Vishnu. We don't know. People say, Jesus, and our hearts leap, but in fact, to them, he wasn't God. He was just a good teacher that you can learn some good values from or just a prophet, you know. This is why discernment so important. I mean, this is why we ask questions to use our discernment. This is why we should talk to each other when we feel someone's going beyond scripture. Why is it taboo to like question a pastor or a preacher or a teacher? I know any of the uh, people that I listen to, at one point or another, you'll hear them say, you should go look this up in your Bible. Like, don't take it for me. Go look for yourself. But people get really upset, you know, when you question their people. They get defensive when in reality we should ask why and then find out ourselves. We should find out why other people seem strict about one thing or another. Why do you choose to not listen to that band or have a problem with that preacher? Sometimes we can talk about them and help them see there isn't a problem. Sometimes we can be alerted to a problem that we can avoid. Who do you say Jesus is and what standard do you use to measure should be a question everyone should ask at one point or another. Any twisting of the truth is evil and can harm. It's poison. We're supposed to be holding firm to the word. As the Bible says, not turning to the left or to the right. Judge what is right and wrong according to what scripture says and completely turn away from evil. 
mark it, avoid it, and help our brothers and sisters not stumble over it. If we are to be reflecting the Lord to those around us, it needs to be a clean mirror we use. That means we ought to be cleaning ourselves up and valuing truth as the most valuable. I'm not saying I'm squeaky clean. God is rubbing my dirt off every day. Anybody who knows me knows I have issues. Um, his reflection through me ought to be coming out clearer as I go, though. I may be paid. F I may be paid for, by but my stains are still there. You know, not all of them. A lot of them are wiped clean. A lot of them are gone. But you know, part of the work is uh, sanctification. The, the ongoing process of the Holy Spirit cleaning up my life and cleaning up my, my mouth and my mind and my heart, right? I used to cuss like crazy. I don't do that anymore. If you hear a cuss word out of my mouth, then my heart is showing a, a place of um, grossness, <laughs> right? Discernment directly relates to every part of our walk. We can't have confidence in our salvation if we don't sit in truth and weigh life by it. We can be saved and not be confident of our salvation. It happens all the time. But when we view life through the word, and that means discernment and changing our lives according to what it says, we then can grow confident in our salvation, in Christ's love for us. And what we believe and why we believe it is we grow in our understanding of who Christ is and what he did and why he did it. And that it's not us. Um, our confidence grows. I know this is a hard topic. This is something that's uncomfortable. Something that, well, people get really mad when you voice it. But absolute truth matters. Jesus is the truth. We ought to search for truth. Figure it out figure out what he means by it, and apply it to life. We need to care enough about others to upset them with the truth in a loving way, as loving as we can. You know, they, they may get upset no matter how well you do it, how well you think you do it, but, um, you know, that's how you love people, is to be honest and truthful with them. You say it because you love them. We can't water down doctrine for the world because they might get offended, because they get offended over things even when you say it nicely. In speaking truth, it's because we know truth. We love others enough to share the beautiful, wonderful, freeing truth of Christ Jesus. Nowhere do I see an example in scripture for a gospel that says, accept Jesus into your heart. He loves you just the way you are. When we see people preaching this, we can see that it doesn't match what scripture says. Turn to Christ and confess your sins. Turn away from your sin and accept that Jesus is Lord. Follow him. Give your life to him. You aren't so great. He is. His love for us and mercy is just amazing. That is why it's so amazing because we don't deserve it. That's the good news. You don't have to work to deserve it. He gives me what I don't even deserve. What I don't even have to strive for. Discernment is critical to not fall in every hole that people dig in front of you, to not get duped by all the almost truths out there, and truthfully to live a life honoring to God. I hope you guys were edified by this. Um, I hope at least you understand a bit more about where I'm coming from when I talk, and it gives you something to think about. I know most people who listen to this know me well, and it's hard to hear some of the things that I say. Believe me, it's hard to say them. But I love you guys. And um, that's why I do this. Please, if you find this edifying, share it, review it, whether you like it or not. Tell me what you think. You can email me at takemetoeternity at yahoo.com. You can send me a Facebook or Yahoo, uh, YouTube message. Um, kind of all over the place now so you can find me all over the place I'm sure if you just google take me to eternity and my name Leah Fiore Tracy you'll find me so let's pray dear heavenly father I pray that you help us grow in you every day 
Help us to discern what you want from us and how you want us to live. Help us to live a life that honors you and puts you above all else. Help us to love others rightly and speak rightly of you. We pray for all of the pastors and teachers out there. Help them to have discernment. Give them strength to do their job and do it well. Give them grace to walk and walk with them as I know only you can do. We love you so much, Lord. We just want to be who you made us to be, to live right by you and to be to please you with our whole selves. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.